Parshas Vayechi brings to a very dramatic end the story of the of Yaakovinu's travels back to Mitzrayim. The brothers, as Rashi tells us, the seeds of the Shebud began uh, during this time, right after Yaakov passes away. The seeds of the slavery and the servitude begin. And a very dramatic Chazal, Rabbi Isai, a very dramatic Medrash, I think opens up a rise to something that we face probably on a daily basis. And the Chazal doesn't give us the answer, but it certainly poses the question. And we have to figure out the answer in our own lives, in our own way. Because the Medrash that a lot of people probably already know, and it's very important to think about it, is a medrash about what happened when the Jewish people, when the Klai Yisrael came to bury Yaakov Avinu, back from its ride to the Maras HaMach Pela. A lot of us know what happened at that particular juncture. What happened when it was time to, when this whole entourage from its ride comes, comes up from its ride, and sure enough, who's there? Esau. Ace of Russia is blocking this entourage and saying, this is not going to happen. Who in the world do you guys think you are? We know Ace had a lot of power and a lot of might. I don't know if he's ready to take on the Egyptian army, but he's certainly ready to take on the group that, the entourage that came. He probably had enough soldiers to handle that particular group. And he says it's not happening. Who in the world do you think you are that you're going to take the Maris of Machpelah? Not the, the recent history is not the only time that people try to challenge our rights to Hebron, our rights to, to the Maras HaMachpelah. So you're not getting in. Well, not getting in. Esau's there. You got Yehuda. You got uh, Yosef. You got Yisachar and Zvulun and Ruben and Shimon and Levin. I got the whole group in there. They're, they're sitting there talking, deliberating. What do you mean? Well, what do you mean, what do I mean? <laughs> I mean, what makes it yours instead of mine? I'm, I'm just as much a, of an inheritor of Yitzchak as, uh, as uh, my brother is. So where do you think that you have a right to come in? Well, what do you mean? We have a deed. He bought it. He bought the rights. There's a star. Really? There's a star? There's a document? Where's the document? You left the back of trying. Uh, okay, well, I don't see any document. And I maintain there's no document. So if you want to... If you want to prove to me that you have right to the Maros HaMach Pela, you're going to have to uh, show me that document. Oh my gosh, it's a big journey back, a few days journey. Do you have somebody who's really swift on their feet who can run back? Right? And who's very swift on their feet? Naftali was very swift. So he said, you know what, Naftali, it sounds crazy, but this Asa fellow here, our uncle, is really getting things messed up and we've got we to gotta produce a document. So he sent Naftali back to get the document. In the meantime... Yaakov is lying there. Sun's beating down. The Middle Eastern sun is beating down on, on the heads of all of these people. You can imagine sitting there, and as we can relate to it, because you know we have uh, we have traffic jams in Los Angeles all the time. Okay, so um, like, but like, what's going on? So Hushim Ben Dun, amazing person that sort of rises out of almost total obscurity. total obscurity to, to sort of get on the scene all of a sudden and say, like, now Hushim and Don didn't have the ability to speak. So he's sort of just wondering, like, what's going on? So they relate to him that, well, we got a complication. What's a complication? So he, they, I guess they write to him, whatever they do, hands him, whatever they do, they convey to him that we got this guy Esav up there, our uncle Esav, and your great uncle, Okay, because he was a Hushim ben Don, he was a son of Don. Your great uncle is blocking the way because he's got a claim that he is entitled to the Maros HaMach Pela. And therefore we got to prove that, that our father bought it and has, has a deed to, pr- to prove that it's ours. That we have a right to, to bury Yaakov Inu there. Hushim ben Don gets the message and hears this very, very uh, immediately very strongly walks up to the front of the line where Esau is sitting there waiting for the document. He takes out a sword and chops off his head. And kills Esau. As it rolls into the Maris HaMach Pela, and as the Bali Musa say, that's Esau's head belonged in Maris HaMach Pela. The rest of his body did a lot of Averis, but intellectually he could have been a very, very great person. So it truly belonged in the, in the burial spot right there where it ended up. 
And he became Chushim and done, the hero. No need for no documents, no need for questioning, no need for, for discussions, no negotiations. End of story. Esav's head gets chopped off, rolls into Mars and Pela, and the Jewish people, the sons of Yaakov, bury the great Sadiq Yaakov Avinu. And the question that Rabbi said we have to ask, and it's not a new question, it's a question that was posed by the great Bali Musser of the early generations, is that this is a very interesting story. It takes a chushim and don to take out a sword and walk up to the front of the line and chop off Esav's head? Where were the other brothers? What, Yehuda was a wimp? Yosef couldn't pull that off? We know what Shimon and Levi can pull off. They weren't, they're not people who in any way were intimidated by, by, by people of power. Why in the world did it take Chushim and Don, this obscure individual, who certainly was not one of the great warriors of Jewish history, to chop off Esau's head and end all the discussion? Why didn't it happen by somebody seemingly greater and more powerful? Why didn't it happen earlier? The answer that's given, and the answer that I say has implications for all of us, Rabbi Sai, really, as we go through life and every day, we go through the grind, we come to school, we, don't, we have school, the days that we're off of school, whatever it might be, we have, we have expectations and we have situations. And the answer given about this particular challenge was that, how did it all start? It started because they were involved in a discussion. It started with Asaph saying, whoa, stop right there. Stop right there. What's the problem? Uh, I claim it's, it's not yours. You claim it is yours. You get into discussion. Everybody say, we are, by nature, we accommodate our surroundings. Think about this. We, by nature, are very, very accustomed to, to the situation that we're living in. And it's very easy for us to sort of get into a lax mode, even if it's a couple of minutes. Certainly if those negotiations went on a little bit longer, to somehow sort of accept the, the position that we're in. Because this is sort of, it naturally evolved that way. We started with a discussion, and then moved to the next step, and the more intense negotiation in the middle. And now, when you stop and you say, where am I? I'm involved in a major negotiation. Now, should you be involved in a major negotiation? Should you be involved with this rush, this ace of uh, Russia? And negotiate with them? No. But if this is sort of where you naturally ended up based on sort of natural events that took place, it's very easy not to recognize what it is that is really happening here. And very often we, and we are in situations where we seem to be accepting of things that we should not be accepting of. It's because we sort of got used to it. So when you are in a certain, a certain situation and things happen... And sort of things continue to happen and sort of, you know, is it as bad? It's really just as bad as maybe you would have seen it the first day, but you don't really respond to it as much. They say about the Chazan Ish, the Chazan Ish was a tzaddik who lived in Europe in a tremendous goyen. And he lived in Europe for a lot of years, and then he moved to Eretz Yisrael. And in Europe, he was in the shtetl, and they say about the shtetl, a bunch of holy Jews, we saw the video this past week, we had a bunch of holy Jews, and everyone kept kosher, everyone kept Shabbos, everyone was a wonderful Jew where he lived. So in his world, there was never a thought of breaking Shabbos. Never a thought. And they say the Chazanish, the first Shabbos, the first week he got to Bnei Brak, and the very first Shabbos that he lived in Bnei Brak, and that's where he moved and he became the legendary Chazanish, I developed this incredible city called Bnei Brak. It now is an incredible place of, of, of Torah, uh, growth and, and education and leadership, an incredible place, B'nai Brak. It all started with, with the Chazanish. They say the first Shabbos, the Chazanish walked out on the street. And he saw a Jew being Machal Shabbos. He fainted. He fainted. He was, it was, it was such, a, such a shock to him. Just heard a similar type of story about Rav Yoshebe's salvation. That, he, that once, he, once he rubbed his, uh, his shoulder on, on, a, on a light, on a, a light switch. By accident, he put on the light, and shut off the light. He was so shocked by what happened, he fainted on the spot. When you are in a situation where things that are unthinkable take place, sometimes you faint. And the Chazanish fainted the first Shabbos. What was very interesting about Boy Sai is he didn't faint the second Shabbos. He saw Chul Shabbos, the second Shabbos too. He didn't faint the second Shabbos. Because naturally, we are in situations where what we are exposed to and what our conditions are become acceptable to us. We don't want it to be. 
but somehow it's okay because we just get used to it. We don't, we can't, it's very hard to develop the shock of, with the, of the shock that we should have when we hear certain things. Somebody never heard a curse word and, and, and landed in a place where everyone's mouthing off with the most horrible language and you start playing a, a rap song with all its, with all its horrific uh, uh, words on it. And for the first time, a guy never heard such words in his life, but he knows that they're terrible words. He'd be, shut it off, it's shocking. But if somehow you hear it here and you hear it there, it becomes part of you know, something that you're just you're exposed to. Is it hard to it, it's, it's hard to develop that same aversion. It's very hard to develop that shock and that response that we need to have sometimes. And somehow when we see certain things, we don't, it doesn't bother us as much. Because, yeah, yeah, it's, what do you mean it doesn't bother you as much? It should bother you. But I, I just got used to it. Hushim and Don woke up to a reality that he found unacceptable. Ace of a Russia is going to hold up my grandfather for being buried at the right time? Unacceptable. Shocking. Unacceptable. It ain't going to happen. And he goes up to the front, he takes a sword, and he chops off his head. The other brothers, it was equally unacceptable, but you know what? They just got a little bit more comfortable. They just, they were involved in negotiations. Well, what, hello, you're negotiating with who? With what? Over, over what? Can't be. But we are, that's the nature of who we are, Rabbi Isai. Which means that really in life, our job is to look at our situation, to look and, and analyze what are we okay with that we should not be okay with. What's okay for us that's maybe more due to our surroundings and our comfort level of what we're sort of used to as opposed to what we should be used to. And it really it sort of begs the question. It forces us to analyze what it is that we are maybe not so upset about that we should be. If somebody says the wrong word and if it doesn't bother us, if it doesn't grate on our ears, maybe it's wrong that it does not grate on our ears. If somebody says something that's inappropriate, disrespectful, and has innuendo that's completely inappropriate, that, would, that should bother us. If it doesn't, maybe, well, well, what do you want from me? I, I hear it all the time. You know, I, it's a challenge. Don't get me wrong. It's a challenge that Yehuda and Shimon and Levi and Reuven and Yosef didn't rise to that challenge. But it doesn't mean that we, can't, we shouldn't be thinking about it. I think our boy is saying this is, the before should ask a very interesting question, right? We know in this week's parsha, Ephraim and Menashe become elevated to the part of the shift they call, right? Ephraim and Menashe, Keruve and Vishimon Yuli. And the question that I, I saw the before should ask is like, what, what, what made these two so special? What they were, were they greater than everybody else? They, Joseph had the two greatest sons, and they, they dwarfed everybody else? Nobody else had sons of, of such stature? And one of the answers given, Rabbi, said, I think this is an incredible message for us. Growing up in Los Angeles in 2020, it's not a simple thing. It forces us to really ask ourselves, what do our conditions, what challenges do our conditions pray for us? That make us, that give us the absolute need to look around and try to find some shock value in what's going on around us. And they say because Ephraim and Asha were unique. All the other cousins of Ephraim and Asha had an incredible schus. Where did they grow up? They grew up in Eretz Israel. They grew up with, they grew up with incredible people around them. They grew up with Yaakov and Bima right there. Where they can learn from him and see him and be exposed to him. To grow up in Eretz Yisrael and have all of the incredible qualities of what it is to be part of the Shvatim, have all of the, all of the, uh, the great Shvatim there, the shift they caught, the, the, the 11 sons of, of Yaakov, Yosef was in the train. Ephraim and Ash were the only ones, Rabbi Sai, who for the first time in Jewish history had the, the need. Or the schus, you can look at it any which way you want to look at, but they didn't control their faith. They grew up in Mitzrayim, a place completely lewd, com- a place completely devoid of, of any type of moral fabric. They were stufezim, the Chazal say. They were immersed in lewdness, and have, how can, in the world you expect me, Ephraim and Menashe, two sweet boys, born to Yosef and you expect them to grow up with any sense of moral fortitude? Wouldn't it be so logical for them to just accept the norms of this horrific place and just sort of adopt the manners of what everybody else is doing around them? 
So can you blame me for my innuendo and my thoughts and my actions and my speech and my language and everything else? Can you really blame me? I'm growing up in the giant. And Yaakov saw them. He saw how special they were. They saw how they didn't fall into that trap. They were not comfortable with simply saying, you know what? This is where I am. This is what people do around me. This is how they speak. This is how they think. This is what they do. I'm just going to go along for the ride. And they said no. They said it's possible not to fall into that trap. They said it's possible to become the Friar of Menashe. Every single Friday night that so many of you get a bracha, some of us wait once a year. Dominican for a lot of people is Yom Kippur. But many others give their children a bracha every single Friday night. Why and how appropriate is it to give that bracha in Los Angeles? In Chutzarit? In America? And not, I'm not saying it's easy growing up in Eretz Israel either. But when you grow up in a place where there's so much of a counter force of what's happening in the world. So much of the morals, so much of the ethics of what's happening in the world is bankrupt. And if it's not bankrupt, you know, it's bad. bankrupt might not even be so bad. But it's even, it's the opposite of bankrupt. It's, it's negative because they give, they're spewing forth values that are counter to anything that a sensible, heartfelt person would, would be acceptable with. How in the world could anybody say, I'm not trying to get political here, but I'm just going to give you an example. How in the world could you defend? We as Jews don't believe in any abortion. But how do you defend a, not, a, a late-term abortion? How do you defend the idea that any time you want to just wipe out that kid and just pull the kid out of the, out of the, the mother's stomach, it's okay, it's, it's fine, because it's all a mother's choice. Did you stop and think about the moral implications? And it's, 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 it's not just, well, you know, no, it's not even any, any angst anymore. Not even, oh my gosh, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a terrible thing you're even weighing, you're not even weighing, what are you talking about? It's nothing, it's not living yet. Not living it? Take a look. Look at the sonogram. Not living? Has no value? It's not viable? What are you talking about? And this is just one example of things that 20 years ago would never be said. 20 years ago would never be articulated. Because it's just unthinkable. And now it's okay. Now we have a value system that is so against the grain of what we consider to be acceptable. Everybody say the challenge for you is unbelievably great. Because this is what you're growing up with. This is what you find acceptable. Having a conversation that shouldn't be happening is acceptable. Talking when you shouldn't be talking is acceptable. So I should be different? I should not look around maybe if I happen to be diving in a shoe where talking is rampant. I hope it doesn't happen, but there are such places. And maybe I somehow feel, oh, it's a big deal. They talk during, after Baruch Shema, I'll talk during, after Baruch Shema. They, go, they leave in the middle of Chazar Shashat, I'll leave in the middle of Chazar Shashat. They walk out of Kriya Satorah, I'll walk out of Kriya Satorah. It's when you're living in such a world, it's hard, Rabbi Yisrael, because there's no moral fabric to sort of connect to. It requires a person on, in his own world, in his own skin, in his own fabric of who he is, to stand up and say, I'm different. I'm not going to follow the norm. I'm not going to be uh, tolerant of what's going on around me when those things are completely abhorrent to what I believe in. I'm not going to be that fellow who doesn't realize what's going on and allow a, an ace of Russia to manipulate my life. I'm, it's not going to happen. It's hard. It's very hard, Rabbi Isai. But obviously it could be done. And that's why we get that bracha every single Friday night. When we receive that bracha, we should be thinking, the person giving the bracha should think this, but the people receiving it, when we get that bracha on a Friday night, we should be thinking, Ephraim and Menashe, what do they stand for? They stand for standing up in any society, under any conditions, under any amount of challenge and say, I am a Jew, and I will live like one, and think like one, and act like one. And I will not be impacted by the people around me. I will not allow society to turn my head around and make me blind to what I should be doing. I'm not going to let it happen. I'm going to be a friar of Menashe. And one last point, Rabbi Isai. And sadly, I lost a student at Valley Torah some years ago over this point. I once gave a shmooz on a Friday. It was the end of the first semester, similar to this year. And by the time second semester rolled around, he wasn't in the school anymore. 
because father said he heard the shmuz. I think at those, at those times we, whatever the shmuz was available on tape or something, on video, and, um, and whatever, he heard the shmuz, the father said, and I will not send my, my child back to a school that espouses this kind of a value system. Sad that he left, it is what it is, but it's not going to prevent me from sharing a das tar with all of you. Can't be inhibited by, by people who maybe react wrongly to a message. Why are Ephraim before Menashe? Why did Yaakov switch his heads? Menashe was older. What's the, what's the idea of the switch? And maybe it's also the idea of how really do you face down a Mitzrayim and look her right between the eyes and says, you know what, you can't get to me. You can't get to me with your shtufei zima and all other types of immorality. You're not going to get to me. Now, Menashe didn't fall either, but why Ephraim first? Why take the younger one and put him first? Because I'll say, because Ephraim stood for Torah. Menashe was a Tamachachim too. Don't get me wrong, but Ephraim, his main job, he sat in the base medrash and he learned. And when you talk about the crown of Torah, you talk about the crown of Jewish leadership, we talk about what's necessary for survival in a crazy world, and we are in a crazy world, Rabbi Yisai. There are a lot of beauties, a lot of brachas in this world, but we are still in a world where there, this, the, the value systems are swirling around us and maneuvering and moving at a, at a very quick pace. And unfortunately, very often moving in the wrong direction. And the way you win that war is you recognize that Friam has the preeminence in Jewish thought. It's great. Leader, Torah leadership is critical, Rabbi. It's great to be a professional and to be a, a, a daf yemi. We saw the incredible videos of people in most of the It's beautiful and it's necessary. But where is the ultimate crown of Jewish success? Where is where ultimate Jewish leadership has, has to be looked upon as being? That's where we're going to go. That's Torah. That's Torah. Ephraim and Menashe are both amazing. Yisachar Zvulin, as we also know in this week's parsha, are incredible partners in life. But at the end of the day, when you want to face down a Mitzrayim, when you want to be in a Ephraim and Menashe, you've got to put the Ephraim first. You've got to put Torah first. You have to know what really counts in this world. And, they all can, and, and everything is good, don't get me wrong. But Ephraim comes before Menashe. Because without Torah, we are, we are lost. Without Torah leadership, we are also very much lost. We need our Gedol. We need our Jewish leaders. We need our Aman Higim. And Torah is what gives them that ability to be those leaders. So if I say we have a lot to be thankful for because Baruch Hashem, we are in a place where Torah is able to be learned 24-7. No one blocks us. We don't have to go through what we saw on Tuesday at that, that horrific, inspiring, and yet horrific video of what Jews had to go through to cling on to the last vestige of, of their dignity, of their humanity, of their Torah. The mysterious nefesh we saw was incredible. We don't have to be snuggling olive bases in the basements of some, some uh, quiet neighborhood somewhere. We can wear our Torah and wear our Judaism with tremendous pride. That's what we have to do in today's world. Yes, the messages are confusing. Yes, we are being exposed to a life where it's so easy to sort of get used to mediocrity, if not a lot worse. But we have to learn from a crime and menashe, to learn from chushim and done. We have to look at ourselves, ask ourselves, what is happening? What is being expected of me? What is my environment like? And if it's not acceptable, you stand up. You say something. We don't have to Baruch Hashem chop off anybody's head. We do have to stand up and say, I am a Jew. Let's do that. Let's be proud of who we are. Let's commit ourselves to Torah. And let's put these up for the Vietnamese.